I did not escape my master. I have no master. don't even understand you guys don't even get it. what the fuck are you guys talking about right now what actually uh, there is one thing hey guys um i would just take a few seconds off of your time um well it appears that uh, more than 90 percent of you watch my video and are more likely to be not subscribed nothing wrong with that just if you watch my video if you like them how about you push that little subscribe button too you know just 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 to have fun <laughs> to have more of my video in your feed that's all bye hello everyone how are you doing? I've been revising for uni and an argument came to my attention. I come from a background of international relations. Thus you might have noticed that all of my videos so far have been about contemporary history, since that has been my main focus of studies. However, there is one event that, for my background, it is key to understand our modern world made of nation-states. The Peace of Westphalia. The ending to one of the most important and bloody conflicts in the history of Europe, the Thirty Years' Wars. However, how did we reach that peace? What were the changes of the European order? Let us learn it together. The Thirty Years' War was a conflict sparked from tension that had grew within the Holy Roman Empire following the previous peace of Habsburg back in 1555. A hasty peace made in order to bring peace back to the empire, more than to create a stable order that could be appreciated by all parts. Due to the amount of titles held by the emperor, many rights granted to the nobles by imperial constitution were ignored, and often the emperor would act as a tyrant by getting rid of of his enemies and putting his allies in their stead in various feuds. And I'm not kidding when I say he had a lot of titles. This is an extract from the Peace of Westphalia. The most serene and most puissant prince and lord, Ferdinand II, of famous memory, elected the Roman Emperor, always August, King of Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, Dalmatia, Croatia, Slavonia, Archduke of Austria, Duke of Burgundy, Brabant, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, Marquis of Moravia, Duke of Luxembourg, the Higher and Lower Silesia, of Wittenberg and Tech, Prince of Swabia, Count of Habsburg, Tyrol, Kirburg, Gorizia, Marquis of the Sacred Roman Empire, Lord of Bukovia, of the Higher and Lower Lusas, of the Marquisate of Slavonia, of Port Naon and Salins. With the spreading of Calvinism in the Empire, a branch of Christianity for which the Peace of 1555 had no provisions, further internal conflict started with many Catholic nobles opposing the spread of Calvinism. Going as far as offering to return all critical assets that had been secularized since 1552, in 1608. But it was the event in Bohemia that led to the conflict to erupt. Ferdinand II, elected King of Bohemia in July 1617, was in no mood to grant these privileges. Educated by Jesuits, he had vowed to eliminate heresy in his patrimonial lands, though he had first confirmed the Letter of Majesty. Ferdinand had no intention of acknowledging Protestant equality in Bohemia. Protestant churches were destroyed at Braunau and Krutzergrab. 
The 30 official guardians of Protestant right defenders, led by Count Mafia's firm, threw the representative of Ferdinand out of a 70-foot-high window of the royal palace of Eratzani, Prague. This act, known to his as the Defenestation of Prague, launched a 30 years' war. The Bohemian rebels claimed that they now held the crown of Bohemia, and that they had not taken it from the Emperor of the HRE, but rather from the Archduke of Austria, because at the time of the Defenestation, he had not been elected Emperor yet. However, his political power at many rows made sure he was going to be elected as such. Ferdinand II, King of Bohemia, Archduke of Austria, King of Hungary, and the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, since 1619, declared Bohemia as an integral part of the Empire. The action was taken mainly because it was feared that the rebellion in the kingdom would soon spread throughout the rest of the Empire. Soon, Spain, also under the rule of the Habsburg family, of which Ferdinand II was part of, joined the war alongside the Duchy of Bavaria, who had been bought at a high price as an ally by offering control over the Palatinate. Through the conflict, the cries of war were not just a discourse of religion, however. A national sentiment was born, with many German princes uniting around the figure of the Emperor as a leader of the German people. The imperialist and Catholic cause in the Thirty Years' War had a number of significant advantages over the Protestant alliances. The first was that of legitimacy. Emperor Ferdinand II may not have possessed a significant army of his own at his accession in 1619, but he was able to use a legal instrument at his disposal to outthrow the rebellion of Frederick V and to impose of his territories and even electoral title to be disposed. The legality of some of his measures were certainly contested, especially the implementation of the Edict of Restitution in 1629. Yet there were strong German national sentiments, which tended to rally around the Emperor in time of crisis. As the French Plenipotentiates at Westphalia reminded Cardinal Mazarin, chief minister of Louis XIV in 1645, the Germans were touched by the love of the country and cannot accept that foreigners dismember their empire. Until 1648, under the laws of the empire, negotiation with foreign powers and the right of war and peace rested within the emperor. Ferdinand II was thus able to exploit such sentiments to rally to his side Lutheran princes such as John George of Saxony in 1612 and again in 1635. The princes were not sovereign powers and thus, according to the laws of the empire, had no right of contracting alliance with foreign powers. The presence of the Spanish army was not only due to help between relatives. In 1618, Count Ernst von Mansfeld, experienced commander and illegitimate son of a Spanish governor in the Spanish Netherlands, led an army of mercenaries from Savoy supporting the Bohemian rebels. A man coming from a territory in the middle of a truce between the Dutch Republic and the Kingdom of Spain, started in 1609. In fact, the Low Countries had been at war since 1566 and were now taking a truce in order to figure out alternative resolution to the war. However, the truce had a time limit of 20 years, at the end of which, in 1621, the Low Countries and Spaniards restarted hostilities. Being a majority Calvinist country and interested in achieving their independence from Spain. However, the Protestant alliance was not faring well. They did not have the same international recognition of the Catholics and thus the same treasury and capacity to fight. There were also internal divisions between Calvinists and Lutherans. Things changed in 1630 when Sweden intervened in the conflict. According to T. Michael Davis from the Troy University in Alabama, Gustavus Adolphus II of Sweden believed that his kingdom's intervention in the Thirty Years' War, an ostensibly internal religious war of the Holy Roman Empire, was necessary to ensure Sweden's security. After the Swedish nobility broke away from the Karma Union, the Union of Norway, Denmark and Sweden, created by the ascension of Margaret I to the thrones of the Old Three Kingdoms, and established to Sweden an independent Protestant monarchy under Gustavus I Vasa, in 1523, Denmark and Russia threatened Sweden on three sides. Denmark retained the southwestern tip of Sweden, mainland, and Norway. 
and Russia had territory to the east and south of Swedish Finland. Swedish control of Estonia and Charles IX's usurpation of the Swedish throne from his nephew Sigismund, the newly elected King of Poland, created an enemy of Poland by the year 1600. With the defeat of the Danish army in 1626, imperial armies occupied much of the German Baltic coast and of Utrecht. The proximity of imperial forces to the Swedish mainland with only a beaten kingdom of Denmark, clinging a few Baltic islands as a buffer, and the beginning of the construction of an imperial Baltic fleet presented a clear danger to Sweden's security from invasion. Thus, politics national security and fear of aggressive Catholic power attempting to return Sweden to the Catholic fold motivated Gustavus Adolphus to invade Germany in 1630, and he used religious rhetoric to generate support of his intervention in Germany, both in Sweden and in Germany. He had intervened in the war by initially landing 14,000 troops, expanding it later in the war to 26,000. In 1613, and then reaching 108,000 by 1632. Of these, 13,000 were Swedish and Finnish, the rest were mercenaries. Thanks to his political and military skills, Gustavus Adolphus had brought what the alliance had lacked to keep up with the Catholics. However, this support didn't come with victory after victory. The Swedish army had suffered many defeats before 1635, counting even the death of Adolphus II himself during the Battle of Lutzen, reaching even a short-lived peace of Prague, where the North German state had made peace with the Emperor. Despite the failures, Sweden kept supporting the conflict. These failures were mostly due to finances. Part of the weakness of the Swedish position was financial. There was never any prospect of central revenues from Sweden underwriting the war effort in Germany. Swedish revenues were insufficient for this period to be possible. On the contrary, the war effort was supposed to pay itself. As Gustavus Adolphus put it, war must sustain war by military success. Once an army had devastated the land it had occupied, it must move on to new territory where it could repeat the process. Fluctuations in the size of the mercenary force undoubtedly account for part of the recurrent difficulties of the Swedish army in Germany. When numbers fell to 10,000 men or so, it could no longer seize territory and supply itself. To gain quarters, an army of 25,000 was much more useful. As the Wien contend to Ren expressed it, nothing provides quarter in Germany except an army as strong as that of the enemy. The more land that could be seized as quarter of the Swedish army, the less land was available to the Imperial army. If the Swedish army was forced back to to its bastion of Mecklenburg and Pomerania, it faced starvation. Movement was what was needed. The advantage of Franco-Swedish military collaboration was that it increased the total army size to 25,000 or more and allowed for a war on mobility, the consolidation of territorial gain and the search for winter quarters in Germany. If the Swedish intervention had allowed the Protestants to keep up with the conflict, France was the power that tipped the scale. France, in fact, unable to tolerate the encirclement suffered by the Spanish-German alliance, decided to intervene in the conflict in the hope to break it, joining the Protestants against the Catholics in May 1635, a move hard to justify for another Catholic kingdom such as France. Cardinal Richelieu, chief minister of King Louis XIII, had already started taking sides by financing the Swedish expedition in 1631 with a million livres each year. Early French engagement in the lowlands were a disaster, reaching a point in which Catholic armies threatened Paris itself in 1636. Then the tide changed once again, with France gaining victories in Germany, reaching a major turn to the tide in 1640 when France started their advance through Flanders, culminating in 1643 with the complete conquer of the region. In the meantime, Sweden used the peace of Prague a piece of Ferdinand II hope could allow for an end to the conflict before France could join the war, to reorganize its armies, and thanks to the French support, in 1636, Sweden was back in the war. In 1637, Ferdinand II died, leaving his son Ferdinand III, who was already commander of the Imperial Army since 1634, to lead the Empire. Through this new renewed advance, Sweden focused on a campaign from the north coordinating with France. 
In 1643, with the first clear major Franco-Swedish victories, the talks at Westphalia started to open on the 11th of July. Receiving the first clear Franco-Swedish request by the 11th of June 1645. A preliminary peace was signed with France in 1646, but a complete treaty was signed and ultimate on the 24th of October 1648. Thank you for willingly coming here as my guest. Okay, no time to explain, read this. The treaty itself had been a culmination of treaties achieved throughout time. All the powers of the conflict had been weakened and made unstable by the war. The House of Augsburg was incapable of keeping up with the war. The Swedish armies were sieging Prague, and with Spain and France starting to negotiate peace for territorial exchange and the possibility of an alliance for marriage, thus breaking the encirclement of France, as soon as 1645 it was clear that Germany was about to lose the war. There's nothing we can do. France itself was starting to have troubles and needed to end the war. With strong winds of rebellion, especially following the death of Cardinal Richelieu in 1642 and of King Louis XIV in 1643, leaving on the throne of Louis XIV at the age of five with his mother, Anne of Austria, and the chief minister Cardinal Giulio Raimondo Mazzarino, naturalizing Jules Raimond Mazarin, disliked by the French nobility due to their foreign origins. Through the intervention of the Duke of Orléans, Switzerland, effectively independent from the matters of interest of the Empire since the Swabian Wars of 1499, achieved full independence from the Empire at Westphalia. Through the war, despite internal division, Switzerland had avoided conflict, mostly providing mercenaries to all sides. However, in 1647, with the Swedish advance, Switzerland signed a treaty by declaring their permanent armed neutrality. The starting point of a status that is kept to these days. Do I have to read all of this? Oh no, just the highlighted parts. Okay... I was streaming though. <laughs> you are now. Article 63. And as his imperial majesty, upon complaints made in the name of the city of Baal, and of all Switzerland, and the presence of their plea of penitentiary, debuted to be the present assembly, touching some procedures and executions proceeding from the imperial chamber of said city, and the other united cantons of the Swiss country, and their citizens and subjects, having demanded the advice of the states of the empire and their council. These have, by decree of the 14th of May of last year, declared the said city of Basel and other street Swiss cantons to be as it as it were in possession of their full liberty and exemption of the empire, so that they are no way subject to the judicators or judgments of the empire. And it was thought convenient to insert the same in this treaty of peace and confirm it, and thereby to make void and annul of all such procedures and arrests given to this count, and what form soever. The Dutch, tired by a conflict lasted for 80 years, with the previously mentioned 20 years truce, were now driven by a desire of peace, a sentiment that the Spanish tried to use to achieve a deal regarding them, to accept to maintain a Spanish buffer state in between them and France. The Dutch lowlands, preferring a weak Spanish neighbor to a strong French one, struck the deal with Spain in 1648. France sought to make peace with Germany, although it was clear that Mazarin was determined to achieve a deal with Germany only after the one with Spain was complete. Derek Croxton believes that this was due to the fact that France considered their main objective to be the lowlands and Germany had been for them a secondary front. Why had France, a state of nearly 20 million people, failed to conquer more territory than Sweden? 
whose population was one-tenth that of France. Der Coxton concludes that the obvious reason was that the empire was only a secondary theatre of war for France. French commitment were kept as low as possible, so as to concentrate more of their war effort against Spain in the Low Countries, where significant success were achieved in the late 1640s. Thus, on the 24th of October 1648, Mazarin and Ferdinand III agreed on the transfer of Alsace, the Sungdau, Baisac, a garrison in Philipsburg to France, as well as the recognition of Metz, Toul and Verdun as the Jure French land, a significant conquer for a nation that considered Germany as a secondary front in which they had achieved little success. Yet Mazarin was accused to not do enough to achieve peace sooner. Article 71. First, that of the chief dominion right of sovereignty and all other rights upon the bishoprics of Metz, Toul and Verdun, and on the cities that named their dionesses, particularly on Mivenaik, in the same manner they formerly belonged to the Empire, shall, for the future, appertain to the Crown of France, and shall be inevitably incorporated there forever, saving the right of the Metropolitan, which belonged to the Archbishop of Treves. Of importance with France was in fact also that the Empire would remain neutral during the Franco-Spanish conflict, taking no sides. Article 4 and Article 5 That the Circle of Burgundy shall be and continue a member of the Empire. After the disputes between France and Spain, comprehended by this treaty, shall be terminated, but nevertheless between the Emperor nor any of the states of the Empire shall meddle with the wars which are now on foot between them. That if for the future of any dispute arises between these two kingdoms, the opposite reciprocal obligation for of not eating the other's enemies shall always continue from between the Empire and the Kingdom of France. But yet, so as it shall be free of the states of Kerr, without the bonds of the Empire or such, such kingdoms, but according to the consultants of the Empire. That the controversy touching between Lorraine shall be referred to arbiters nominated by both sides, or it shall be terminated. By a treaty between France and Spain, or by some other friendly means, it shall be free. As well for the Empire as electors, princes and states of the Empire aid and advance this agreement by an amicable interposition and of other offices pacification without using the force of arms. Sweden also strengthened its position and role, striking a peace with Germany. They received the western half of Pomerania, together with land in the eastern part, notably Stettin, Rügen, Wismar and the Pisphoric of Bremen and Ferdinand, which they had taken from the Danes in the 1643-45 war. Article 29. With the paragraphs Prince Louis Philip and Prince Frederick and Prince Leopold Louis be understood here as inserted. After the same manner they are contained the instrument or treaty with the Empire with Sweden. Sweden also aimed at the contentment of the soldiery, as one of their goals at the Congress of Westphalia. The Swedish army, not trusting the government, sent a plenipotentiary to the Congress to protect its interests. These efforts were rewarded by a payment of 5 million Reichstaller to the paid Swedish troops. A preliminary peace between Sweden and the Empire was signed in 1647. However, Swedish troops remained until 1652 to make sure that their debt would be paid in full. The negotiation for peace lasted for five years, 1643 to 1648, and no truce or armistice were signed in the meanwhile. Thus, with the conflict and engagement still ongoing, while diplomacy was still occurring, making it even harder to negotiate a already complicated peace, Initially, Ferdinand III sought to achieve separate peace, preferring to concede peace to Catholic France instead of Protestant Sweden, but in the end settled for a single agreement with all the parties. The Emperor conceded representation to all the German states, as well as various powers such as the ability to call in war and to raise armies without the consent of the German states, which now were to be sovereign within their own internal affairs, religious matters included. Article 64 and to prevent for the future of any differences arising in the 
Celtic state. All and every one of the electors, princes and states of the Roman Empire are so established and confirmed their attained rights, prerogatives, liberties, privileges, free exercise of tutorial right, as well as ex- Oh my god, cat, what the f- <laughs> Okay. Exolastic as politic lordships regales by virtue of the present transaction, that they can never ought to be molested therein by any whomsoever upon the matter of presence. LXV. I don't know Roman numerals, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, they shall enjoy with a con contradiction the right of suffrage and all del deliberations touching the affairs of the empire. But above all, when the business at hand shall be the making of interpreting of laws, and declaring of wars, imposing of taxes, levying or quartering of soldiers, erecting new fortifications in the territory of the st states, or reinforcing the old garrisons, as also when a peace of alliance is to be concluded and treated about, or the like, none of these are the things that shall be acted in the future without the suffrage and consent of the free assembly of the states of the empire. Above all, it shall be free perpetually to each of the states of the empire to make alliances with strangers for their preservation and safety, provided nevertheless such alliances be not against the emperor or the empire, nor against the public peace. And this treaty, without prejudice to the, to the oath by which everyone is bound to the emperor and the empire. As for the art of the war, the rebellion in Prague and the kingdom of Bohemian, things did not change. The powers of the Protestant alliance accepted for it to be recognized as an integral part of Augsburg's domain alongside Austria, and the confirmed principle of cuius religion, eius religio. The religion is of who has the power. It remained a Catholic kingdom. The Peace of Westphalia has been one of the most important treaties of Europe, if not of the world. It had been reached after years of fighting and hard negotiation without ever having a truce first. Since the beginning of the war, the religious alliance had started to lose identity to religion itself and started counting more under newborn nationalism. The peace had changed the balance of power, breaking the Spanish German encirclement of France, increasing and solidifying Sweden's place as power, as well as France despite also starting a civil war in the country. Through the peace, Spain was starting their slow decline, while the Dutch lowlands and Switzerland achieved independence, and to the German states brought more autonomy and reinforced the idea of each state being sovereign over their own internal matters, such as religion and internal politics, while also lowering the power of the emperor, who had gained far too many. Now the emperor had become an institution that required his constituents to participate in it, to work, instead of ruling over them, creating the modern international system where the nation-state is sovereign and the ultimate institution. However, most importantly, the peace put an end to the European wars of religion. It has been very interesting to research this topic and I hope it was enjoyable for you as well. Perhaps if you really liked it, how about you leave a like and maybe subscribe? Anyway, you can find all the sources beneath, but uh, the two main books referenced are Richard Bonney, The Thirty Years War, 1618-1648, and International Law, Peace of Westphalia, original Latin text and the English version. One other thing. Also, yeah, go and check out uh, Kenna, also known as iBookies, on uh, Twitch, where she streams as well as her YouTube channel where she uploads uh, the, her streams. Uh, you can also find it on my channel as well, within the people that I kind of endorse. So yeah, go check her out. She's fun. She does lots of horror. Quite cool. Go check her out. I've been Riccato and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye. Are we done now? Oh yeah, you can go now. You know you could have just asked!